Joining me live now from Adelaide is the Minister for Social Services, Amanda Rishworth. Amanda Rishworth, on this Mother's Day, thanks so much for joining us. Can I, I start <laughs> Thank by... Thank you. Uh, Great to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> we won't detain you long, but get, look... Uh, what doesn't the government like about this proposal of Peter Dutton's to allow those on the dole to earn another $150 a fortnight before they uh, get uh, the job seeker payment taken off them? Well, firstly, I would say that this is a thought bubble by Peter Dutton. Um, and uh, what we don't know is uh, how this will actually encourage workforce participation. He's provided no evidence to suggest that this would uh, alleviate barriers that many people on JobSeeker have in gaining employment. He quoted 75% of job seekers uh, don't report any earnings, but, of course, that means means they're already not taking up the income-free threshold of $150. So I think that's the first question. Second question is, what is the cost uh, to the taxpayer of this? Um, I, I don't think... Um He's outlined or done any costings about uh, the fiscal implications of this. And uh, so I think there's a question for him there as well. But in addition, I think when it comes to job seeker, we don't want to see people uh, staying on the safety net. We want to see people move into uh, employment. And I think one of the questions is how much longer would his proposal uh, have people staying on job seeker uh, as a a result of these changes. So th there are a lot of questions and potential unintended consequences uh, of the Leader of the Opposition's proposal. Uh, we are working through very methodically uh, both a review of the employment services, as you mentioned. There's a committee looking into them at the moment to make sure they are fit for purpose in supporting people into employment. But equally, I think um, also we have a white paper process now on workforce participation um, and how we boost that. And from the Leader of the Opposition, this is unfortunately just a thought bubble with no substantive analysis behind it. Just on that, Minister, he says it's $700 million. Do you dispute that figure? I do dispute that. Over the Ford estimates, I, do, I think it would be a lot more than $750 million. Is this policy not worth a thought, though, when so many businesses are struggling for workers? Look, I absolutely want to see more people into employment, um, but keeping them on job seeker uh, is unlikely to be the answer. It's ensuring that our people have the skills they need, and that's backed up with our increase in university places, our increase in TAFE places. It's it's encouraging employers to take a chance on people living with disability, uh, people over the age of 55. When I talk with people uh, older workers, uh, they're applying for jobs, they're not getting a chance. So I think it's much more complex. Um, and what the opposition leader hasn't done is actually demonstrate how this will actually lead people to get off the safety net and into a full-time job. He hasn't explained that. Um, and it seems to not have the analysis behind it. Now, of course, we're going through a whole range of scenarios and analysis through our white paper on, uh, on labour and uh, full employment. And so we will continue to, to work through that process in a rigorous way. And what thinking went behind making the increase to JobSeeker $40 a fortnight as opposed to a, a higher increase or a lower increase? Well, look, we had to strike the right balance, recognising that there were cost of living challenges, particularly for those on the lowest income. Of course, there is indexation to the job seeker payment, but we know uh, this that there is, uh, you know, other pressures as well that uh, exceed uh, indexation. So finding a, the right balance between um, what is affordable and um, what we can uh, responsibly deliver uh, and I have to say, it needs to be seen also in the context 
of the energy supplement or the energy rebate that's coming through people's bills, the increase to Commonwealth rent assistance as well. Uh, so all of those things were taken into account when we settled on an increase to uh, the base rate of JobSeeker. All those things are considered. Um, but of course, one of the challenges does exist for people over the age of 55, and that's why we've extended the higher rate of JobSeeker to those aged over 55, because we know um, they face extra barriers to gaining employment, including discrimination and did, poor health. Did you receive advice from Treasury as to how inflationary the $40 would be? And if so, what was that advice? The advice across the board uh, was that our budget measures, our cost of living uh, package, would not add uh, to inflation. Indeed, attacking some of those uh, really acute price pressures, including rents through our Commonwealth rental assistance and our energy bills actually uh, put downward pressure on inflation. But across the board, our cost of living pressure, uh, uh, sorry, our cost of living package um, uh, did not add to inflation. Is it a concern politically for the government that what is being called Middle Australia does appear to be a bit left out in this budget? You could have a nurse on 80,000 married to a, a police officer on 80,000, let's just pick out two professions, with three kids who don't get the electricity bill relief, for example. Look, one of uh, the key points about this budget is it does build on our October budget. And in that October budget, we have significant relief for childcare fees, for example. Now, it wasn't long ago that uh, the opposition was crying that we were giving too much to Middle Australia uh, with that really cheaper childcare policy. Indeed, uh, that policy uh, um, is means tested, but we increased. Uh, 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 the top end of uh, that where it's means tested significantly. Now, those opposite uh, in the opposition were uh, saying that this was too much for middle Australia. So the opposition has to work out uh, what it's saying. We have had a significant investment into cheaper childcare that starts on the 1st of July that many families across this country will benefit from. We've obviously got... Uh, 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 training, uh, free training for people that have older children in ta free TAFE places, more university places, um, a real investment in small business, for example, um, such as uh, increasing uh, the instant ad asset write-off to $20,000. So I think you've got to look at the package and the budget as well, the a, a whole. The, the asset We've write -off. had to do a careful balance. M Minister, just quickly, the asset write-off was, was uncapped before, so you've actually reduced that. Well, look, this has been an increase because many measures were coming to an end. Um, so we have uh, taken okay. action on, in a number of these areas to deal with, uh, uh, to deal with um, measures that were already coming to an end. Can I ask, the government seems to be part of a concerted wages push in terms of its submissions to the Fair Work Commission. Isn't there a concern that this push is inflationary? Look, I don't think that people getting uh, decent wages, particularly those on the minimum wage, have demonstrated at all uh, that this would add to inflation. I think what we know is there's price pressures in the economy and we have to, uh, uh, we have to work alongside the Reserve Bank in not adding to inflation. Uh, but I don't think um, anyone's demonstrated that an increase to the minimum wage to ensure that those on the lowest incomes um, keep up with the cost of living um, have indeed uh, demonstrated to be uh, adding to inflation. We do have an inflation challenge and, and that is why the government's budget has been responsible. Um, across our two, two budgets, October and now, we have banked 87% of the upgrade of revenue that's really significant. Compare that to the previous government where they banked about 40% in their last budget. So we have shown uh, spending restraint. Um, when it comes to wages, though, I think uh, most, uh, uh, most people would recognise those on the lowest incomes uh, do deserve to have their wages keep up with the cost of living.
What did you make of Peter Dutton's suggestions in the budget reply around changes on gambling advertising? Well, look, I um, was, uh, I guess, surprised that uh, uh, that Peter Dutton and his whole team had nine years to take action uh, on um, on on online gambling reform. And what we saw from them was uh, sit on a report um, and actually not actually tackle uh, this uh, in really important problem to minimise gambling harm. So, look, I, I am interested uh, to, to see what the opposition uh, will do when the House of Representatives uh, committee report comes out. Um, we're certainly looking forward to it. We've already taken action, for example, recent announcement on banning the use of credit cards because we don't think people should be going into debt uh, to, uh, to gamble. That's, that's the nub of it. So uh, we've already taken action. We've introduced uh, new effective uh, gambling advertising taglines. Uh, we've also uh, announced classification changes when it comes to uh, uh, exposure of children to enticements to gamble. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, and uh, what I would say is I, uh, uh, as we work through what, what can be done and the response to the House of Representatives Standing Committee. I look forward to uh, the opposition's cooperation on that. All right. Your South Australian colleague Don Farrell's just been to China. He's just announced this morning that the Chinese Foreign Minister will be coming here. Uh, are you confident trade sanctions will be lifted? Well, look, uh, I think um, from all reports, the visit by Minister Farrell has made uh, significant progress uh, in stabilising the relationship. Of course, uh, what he has said is that there is now a pathway uh, towards um, uh, working with the Chinese government around the issues around trade, and I think that is um, very positive. Um, I think this has been uh, very much well Welcomed across the board as a first step, and I look forward to seeing further progress on that. And just finally, looks like we're about to see the voice legislation before the parliament getting closer to that referendum. What do you think of the prospects of the referendum succeeding? And would something like the job seeker rise be something the voice would be consulted on? Well, firstly, um, uh, is the voice referendum um, something that I think will succeed in my, my conversations with people right around the country? Um, a, lot, a, a lot of people are saying this is long overdue. And so I think there is some really uh, positive, um, positive mood in the country uh, to give First Nations people um, a voice uh, and allow them to be consulted on the issues that do affect them. Um, in terms of something like uh, Job Seeker, um, The Voice will uh, make representations on behalf of the issues that affect uh, affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, that's that's very clear. And the government uh, uh, will take that advice um, and and listen to that advice. Not so unlike, I think, a number of other advisory committees that we got. Well, well, that 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 is a matter for The Voice. That is a matter for the priorities that The Voice has set. Um, uh, do, do they make legislation? No. Do they have a veto no, power Minister, of what government does? The, no. The, uh, let's, let's, let's just look at that for a second. You're about to introduce a budget not telling anyone, well, unless I reveal it or another journalist reveals it, that you are um, increasing JobSeeker. Do you go to The Voice for advice on that because you just said, well, that would be up to them. But isn't it up to you? We can seek advice uh, from The Voice. Would you in um, that instance? And, and that will be a matter... Well, at this point, uh, we haven't got a legislated voice. And I think uh, what you're doing is dealing in a whole lot of hypotheticals. There's obviously going to be consultation on the voice on a range of issues that disproportionately affect First Nations people. Um, and once that voice is set up, it'll, there'll be a clear process of when government uh, consults with them. I'm not going to uh, jump into hypothetical questions of an 
advisory body that uh, the Constitution doesn't even have in yet and we haven't legislated. But I very much look forward uh, and I'm not afraid as a minister to be able to have a a group of First Nations people uh, that I can go and speak with and get advice about different issues that affect them. Indeed, I think that that would make uh, government decisions uh, very legitimate um, and make sure that we're actually consulting um, First Nations people. So I do... Uh, I'm, I'm not scared of consulting the voice on matters that affect them, uh, but we're a long way from that uh, at the moment. We haven't even got it set up, but I have a lot of uh, faith in the Australian people that uh, uh, once we see this referendum and this referendum goes ahead, that we will see a voice to ensure that recognition of our First Nations people is in the Constitution.